Welcome everyone. I'm Councillor Lindstad, Cabinet Member for Traffic and Transportation. A few housekeeping bits of information. If the continuous fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the room and public gallery by the staircase, stairwells. Do not attempt to use the lifts. We will assemble at Queen Victoria's statue in front of the civic offices. In order to comply with the Guildhall Trust's fire marshal regulations, anyone who signed in at the Guildhall reception desk should sign out when leaving the building at the end of today's meeting. Please can everyone use the microphones and remember to switch them off when they have finished, otherwise the camera will remain on you. Right, some introductions. Councillor Heaney. <coughs> Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> Councillor Graham Heaney, I'm the Labour Group Spokesman for Traffic and Transportation. Thank you. Um, Councillor Cal Peter Harris. Yeah. Councillor Scott Peter Harris, I am the Conservative Spokesperson for Traffic and Transportation. Thank you. Um, Tristan. Tristan Samuels, Director of Regeneration. Michelle. Michelle Love, Safer Travel Manager. Kevin. Kevin McKay, Parking Manager. Thank you. Is that is that Denise hiding behind there? <laughs> yeah, Denise Basto, Parking Office Manager. Thank you. Felicity Tibbury, Assistant Director for Transport. Gareth James, Solent Transport's Future Transport Zone Manager for Portsmouth City Council. Hayley Chivers, Acting Transport Planning Manager. Damon Lone, Senior Transport Planner. Jane Dodino, Local Democracy Officer. Thank you all very much. Um, I don't think we have any apologies, do we, Jane? Okay, thank you. Members, Declaration of Interest. Any declarations of interest? None? Scott? Okay, lovely, thank you. So we'll go on to... Um, the first item, on-suite residential charging, charge point scheme, phase two, six month review, and that's Hayley, are you presenting this? Thank you. Thanks. Um, so this is an information report providing an update on phase two of the on-street residential charge point scheme following six full months of operation. The scheme has installed 62 electric vehicle charge points in residential streets which do not benefit from off-street parking. The solution utilises spare electricity supply from lamp columns with charge points fitted directly into those at the front of footway or into slimline bollard with electricity fed under the pavement where the lamp columns are at the rear of footway. The key points to highlight from the monitoring of the first six months of the trial are usage of the charge points has seen a 19% increase in electricity consumption. The top use sites received on average 20 charging events per month with the top sites seeing on average 39 charges per month. There are nine sites which have received minimal use and the reasoning for which will be investigated further. However, five have yet to have designated parking bays marked due to no confirmation of EV ownership. And overstaying is occurring during daytime at some locations and these will be investigated and appropriate action taken to ensure equitable access to the charge points. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Heaney, any comments or questions? Not particular ones. I mean, I, I note the comment being made about the overstaying ones, and I raised that at the briefing meeting we had and asked some questions about that. And obviously, that's being investigated, so we'll, I'll obviously wait to hear what, uh, what comes out of that. Okay, thank you. Councillor Peter Harris. After, I've just quickly um, just looked at this again. On, on 4.2, it says about the remaining seven bays have not been marked, and sure that there is not any impact. I mean, I'm just going to just throw it out there. I had, I had a couple of residents that have actually gone to have these put in and they haven't had the bays marked and there's been instances where they've had to actually go back out to a TRO. Um, how many instances of that have we actually had? Because I, I can just talk of, think of two that I've had to deal with. Um, I don't know the exact figure um, on that. We basically, at the time of installation, we check EV ownership and, and mark them if we know. We then go back to residents periodically or they come to us and we mark them in phases um, and there are some remaining now that have been unmarked for a while. Um. That's, that's fine. I, I just think it's, um, it's just worth noting that obviously the, the people are buying the vehicles, it's just the time it takes for the vehicle to actually get into their um, possession which is, is becoming a bit of an issue as someone who has an electric vehicle on order. Um, I know that it's painful to wait for these vehicles. Um, 5.4 of the report talks about these seven top locations, which I think is, is quite interesting, um, with the highest usage. Is that more than one vehicle? Is that multiple vehicles? 
it doesn't actually state it within the in the usage. Um, so we can't tell whether that's multiple vehicles or the same vehicle. Um, we we don't monitor which vehicles are using the charge points. We just got the number of charges. Okay, no, thank you. I just thought it would be an interesting figure to know. And and obviously, um, obviously, five point seven says about overstaying. I, I think that's something that we all know that does happen. I think it's just a case of monitoring it. Um, also, we're able to talk about the consumption of the electricity because obviously, I imagine that with all the energy pricing, that that would have that would have risen. And um, what is the the, the um, price rise on that? Um, so, as it stands, these ones are with um, Joju, and they have not, at present, risen, um, had an increase in the price. Ubertricity have seen an increase in their prices um, recently, and we um, are working with Joju. That is likely to follow. Yeah, just then, when those, those increases do come, are you able to circulate it to members, just so we have an idea of what we're looking at for those people that are purchasing electric vehicles, so we can get the information out? Yeah, definitely. We'll send that around. Thank, thank you for that. It's a very good report. Can I ask just one thing? Um, in uh, 5.8, um, it says some locations where the vehicle is plugged in for significantly longer than the vehicle required to charge. I may have issues overstaying. Um, are we, can we do anything about that? I mean, be, I suppose this relies on CEOs I'm going and picking up. So at the moment with overstaying, there is, um, there's no time restriction on the base, so there's nothing um, to stop a vehicle doing that um, and that's where we're trying to understand on a case-by-case -case basis why they're doing that whether it's because there's parking congestion in the area that the only EV in the area so we're just reviewing them individually as to what the reasoning is um, we may be able to do some um, letter drops in the area um, to explain polite sharing and if need be we can sort of put financial disincentives in place and presumably, if, um, the, I've seen the, the, the map showing the list of, of places that were requesting uh, EV charging points. Presumably, um, local residents will be told that they may have to share with somebody else close by. Yeah, we're quite clear to residents when they apply that these are not their private own um, private space. These are to share for the, all residents in the area. But they might need a reminder near the time. Okay, that, that's great. Any more questions? I'm glad to see that, that there is quite a demand. I, I realise um, you've got to get funding for more, haven't you? Uh, to in, put in more yeah. charging points? Yeah, we've got um, phase three. We've got over 300 requests. Um, we're just working on getting funding for. Brilliant. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so it was just an update. So I'm glad to see it's, uh, it's been so successful. So thank you very much. Um, Next one is Portsmouth Rental E-Scooter Trial Extension. Is that you, Gareth? Thank it you. is indeed, Councillor Stark, yes. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, this report provides an update on the operation of the rental e-scooter trial um, and seeks approval to further extend the trial from the current scheduled end date, which is the 30th of next month, November 2022, um, up until the 31st of May 2024. So, the recommendations... Um, they are that we um, note the information contained in this report on the rental e-scooter trial to date, including voice commitment to continue running safety skills events and providing complimentary helmets to attendees at the events. Approves renewal of the vehicle special order for Portsmouth's e-scooter rental scheme to the 31st of May 2024 in accordance with the DFT's new end date to legally enable the trial to extend beyond its scheduled end date of the 30th of November 2022. Approves the extension of Voy's contract initially by 12 months to enable Voy to continue operating the trial beyond the scheduled expiry of the current contract period. Um, and also notes that an update of the rental e-scooter trial would be brought to this meeting uh, in September 2023, um, as well as any decisions that would need to be made about the service with respect to the remainder of the trial or the post-May 2024 period. So for the, um, the detail of the report, what I'll do is just pick out um, a, a few, few pieces that uh, I think are either um, you know, well worth reiterating or are uh, newer information compared to the, the previous um, reports about the e-scooter rental trial that have been brought to this meeting. Um, so in terms of background, um, 
It's, again, worth reiterating that the Department of Transport is only permitting the trial of rental e-scooters. So the use of privately owned e-scooters on the public highway remains illegal during the trial period. The DFT had originally planned that all its trial schemes would end by the 31st of March 2022, subsequently invited trial areas to extend them to November 2022. Um, then on the 12th of May 2022 this year, uh, the DFT sent an email to all authorities and operators running the trials outlining its plans beyond uh, November. Um, that email is, is attached to this report as an appendix and outlines how a new low speed zero emission vehicle category is to be created. Um, and then um, a little later on the 28th of June 2022, uh, the DFT sent out a further email um, indicating that ministers had approved an 18 month extension of the current e-scooter trials to the 31st of May 2024 for all those areas that wish to continue. And that email again is um, included as, a, as an appendix to this report. Um, so just looking uh, at, uh, again, something that I think is very important to reiterate is that um, the parking um, for e-scooters in uh, Portsmouth, it's a fully racked scheme and, and that's, uh, that would continue with parking racks located in tightly geofenced mandatory parking zones. Um, rental e-scooter users must leave the uh, e-scooter in a parking rack at the end of their ride. The uh, geofencing technology ensures that the rides can only be finished there. Um, this has resulted in a very low number of complaints compared to the more free-floating micro-mobility services. And this, um, this approach that um, Portsmouth pushed for is becoming increasingly popular in, in other e-scooter trial areas around the UK. Um, as regards um, safety, uh, the um, safety skills events, which were, were mentioned in the first recommendation, they've been very well received by attendees with 97% of respondents feeling positive about their learning experience and stating they now feel more confident using a rental e-scooter um, than they did before the training. Um, I think the feedback uh, really reinforces the, the importance of providing these in-person training opportunities to beginners as well as the mandatory um, online training that's delivered through the app, um, especially while e-scooters remain a, a, a fairly novel um, mode of transport. So just a, a couple of quotes in there. Um, uh, one of them, someone said, I'm so happy I did take the course before riding. It's no toy and certainly not as easy as it seems watching others. Um, it will take a bit of practice to get the hang of it properly. I've now enjoyed the first ride and can't wait to go on my second. So I think that, that came across in the um, survey and in the um, councillor's feedback, which I'll come on to a bit later as well, the importance of continuing with uh, offering these, these um, in-person events. Um, for uh, enforcement, just a reminder again that uh, voice uh, uh, distinctive scooters carry a registration um, plate, so anyone can uh, report any wrongly parked e-scooter or bad driver behaviour. Um, all the contact details are uh, in the report. Um, you've got the uh, user form uh, web address. You can also uh, call um, a free phone number or you can email support at voyapp.io. So all of those ways are available and if you don't catch the registration plate, um, then you can and, uh, just give as much information as you can about the time and location and so forth and, and Voy will um, use that to uh, identify the, the person involved. Can um, I butt in there, Gareth, and, and give the number because um, I have to keep looking it up, but um, um, I've, I've reported quite a few and they've all, the Voy people at the other end of the line have always been very, very supportive. So for anybody who's watching, I'm sure there'll be hundreds of people watching a TNT um, decision meeting and um, the number is 0800 376 8179. Am I right? Yeah. That's exactly right, yes. Good, and I think we need to publicise that a bit more because I think people get frustrated if they they think they have to give the, the, the registration plate and it's not always easy to, to see it because particularly if they're going past you quite, quite quickly. Thank you. Carry on. Thank you. Um, and, and so for the, um, the key statistics um, for the trial to date, so um, uh, obviously updated since uh, the, the previous extension. So the, these, um, these figures are um, up to the 15th of September, um, so just, just about a month ago. Um, so the, the number of um, unique users in Portsmouth now is uh, just under 60,000, so it's, it's 58,857. Um, Together, um, there's uh, 1,245 kilometres of, um, sorry, it's one, uh, sorry, 1,245,000 uh, kilometres of um, being travelled, um, and that's uh, total rides is 446,876. 
Um, really importantly, when we think about what the you know the aims of these trials are, um, the the number of car trips we place is is uh, now um, coming up close to 200. 200,000, so it's 196,625, um, and that equates to a, a carbon dioxide equivalent saving of 105 tonnes, and that's ju just you know the Portsmouth scheme alone. Um, the number of unique users has grown by 65% in the last um, seven months. Um, Coming on to uh, survey data, which I know is something that we, we discussed when we um, were, were in a, um, the meeting uh, regarding the uh, experimental traffic order extension. So we were, um, as planned, we've carried out an additional survey. That's the, the fourth um, council survey um, about e-scooters. That took place uh, between the 8th of August uh, and the 4th of September. Um, excellent response rate. That's the best response rate we've had so far with 3,508 responses. Um, encouragingly, uh, um, the the survey showed that 54% of respondents would have uh, used a car or a taxi for their last journey if they had not used a rental e-scooter. Um, this is broadly consistent with uh, the survey findings from the, the earlier waves and a, a far higher figure than in most cities abroad, um, showing that, that Portsmouth's rental e-scooter scheme is providing a genuine alternative to private car use. Um, in the report, it's, uh, some of the findings are summarised and there's a, there's a full appendix which goes into all of the detail of, of that survey and um, broadly similar findings to um, earlier, um, the earlier surveys for those that are acquainted with those, um, but I, I would encourage you to yeah, have, a, have a good look at that and um, ask any, any questions that um, emerges from it. Um, on to safety. Um, of course, vitally important, so we always um, uh, spend, spend a lot of uh, time and effort scrutinising these figures. Um, so, um, as noted in the report, there's um, 252 uh, accidents reported in the trial to date. That, that word accident can be a little bit misleading. It's um, 124 of those are damage only, so that's things like a, a phone falling to the floor, for example. Um, but moving on to the actual um, injuries, it's 104 slight and 24 um, serious. Um, can, you, can you explain what serious is? Because people think that you know, people have had their legs amputated or um, you know, dire consequences. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so so, so the, the Department for Transport uh, definitions are, uh, are what um, for use. Um, what we find is that, uh, first of all, it's important to say that all the reported serious accidents involve injuries only to the user and not to other road users, um, such as pedestrians. Um, what we've got now is that uh, we've, uh, there's been some independent analysis conducted by STIA uh, in, in early 2022, and we've had some more recent um, independent analysis, which is ongoing, um, both of which have indicated that the number of serious injuries is um, lower than, than, than those um, statistics uh, suggest. Um, several of the VOI incidents are ones that can't be verified, so they, they aren't able to uh, find out from the user, you know, what, what the result of the um, of the accident was, um, and, and there's no accompanying data. Also, VOI and, and I believe the other operators uh, sort of err on the side of caution, um, so you'll see that the, um, the the 24 accidents to date, most most of them are very much at the um, sort of lower end of the serious scale. We're not talking about uh, life-changing injuries. Um, we're talking more about le leg injuries um, and, uh, and and so forth. Certainly, things that you would uh, rec recover from. Um, the, um, I think something else that isn't in the report, because again it's from that uh, more recent piece of data that's worth mentioning, is that the um, um the accident rate it, it, we now know has gone down, which is uh, which is what you would expect. As uh, you know, with an e-scooter trial, as people become more accustomed to using e-scooters and they become more normalised, um, and we, we've seen that in um, in Portsmouth and indeed uh, in, in uh, Southampton, which is also run by Voy, that the accident rate uh, for e-scooters is going down as the trial progresses, which is um, you know extremely encouraging and something that we'll we'll um, continue to monitor closely. Um, so I hope that that's answered um, your question on that, Councillor Stagg. Yes, lovely. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you. Shall I go over to questions from, from councillors? Councillor Peter Harris. Thank you, Chair. And bear with me. I'm, I'm going to go through the, um, the trial opinion survey, way four findings. So if everyone want to go to that, that would probably be the best place to start. Um, obviously, we've looked at the I'm just going to go into the management summary that's continued to impact on other modes of transport. 
It says it's reduced usage of public transport at a consistent level since the start of the trial by around 37%. Is that like a knock-on effect? So effectively, people that aren't taking bus journeys, aren't using taxis, aren't using trains. Is that is that what we're getting at from from that finding? So, uh, sorry, Councillor Paytaris, can you just please repeat which finding you're referring to? Some, it's obviously a lot in there, so I just want to. Yeah, just, no, it's, it's, it's in there. Gary. Um, you know the where, you know where the survey starts. So basically, go to the e-scooter rental survey, way for findings, and it's on the top paragraph. It's the top. It's the top hot line. So it's impact on other modes of transport. Yeah, thank you. What That's is right. the number on the page? It doesn't actually have a number on oh, this page. I think it's, no, it's page 41. Yeah, page 41. It's there, but it's like in the middle of the text. Okay, so, so this is on the, um, this is on the, the appendix. Yeah. Sorry, just bear with me a second. Okay, so, so in terms of how the e-scooter trail affects usage of other modes of transport, yeah, I think first of all it's, it's worth noting that the uh, Wave 4 results are consist consistent with um, previous waves. Um, so it showed reduced uh, usage of public transport at a consistent level since the start of the trial um, by around 37% for those um, using the e-scooters. So that's the, that's the uh, figure you, you're talking about, yeah? <laughs> that's, that's exactly it. Um, the point, point I'm getting at, because if we have a 37% knock-on effect, do we know if that's affecting certain routes more than others? Because I, I think the issue we're having is we subsidise buses regularly and we subsidise that sort of transport. And if, if people are not getting on a bus and all of a sudden getting on a scooter, um, no doubt the bus company will turn around to the council and say, or oh, you owe us, we need to subsidise this route because they're get, jumping on a scooter and our, our, our levels are down. That, that's what I'm getting at. So I think it's, it would be conscious if we could find out in, in future, um, just future information, whether what routes are being affected, because clearly some are um, on that point. Is that something we can do, Gareth? We, we, can, we can certainly take that away and, and look into it. Um, at the moment, I think it's fair to say that we wouldn't have any way of knowing if particular routes were being affected other than um, looking at you know, where, where the e-scooter uh, service is, you know, is more sort of densely offered um, and which trips that might affect. I think it's just worth mentioning on this as, as well because um, the... Um, there was uh, somebody that was asking recently about the effect on walking as well, um, and, and it's very easy to, to look at that survey and to see the portion of people that are doing something less than before, whether it's walking or using public transport. But what you also find, and you can see, um, you can see on the Your City, Your Say um, summary of, um, uh, of this research, is, is that you also see those people that are using public transport more than they did um, before the trial. Um, so it's, it's, it's a smaller percentage walking actually is a, it, it kind of it, it evens out and um, but it really gets at the fact that um, if, if you're not needing to take a car for that first part of your journey and you've got these different options to get around then you, you might actually be walking and potentially taking public transport a bit more because you know the scooter doesn't do the, the whole job for you so I think it's 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 worth mentioning um, that but we can look a little bit more into what as you say with the sort of uh, more spatial um, impacts of it I just think the detail could be there because obviously we, we, I think we had a paper recently where it showed that bus journeys were considerably down in certain areas and obviously we're talking about e-scooters here that are actually having an effect on public transport so there's going to be a knock-on effect there that obviously people can see it's a cheaper mode of transport because quite frankly buses are expensive to get around in the city. I think that's quite widely accepted by a lot of people um, and the scooter is a lot cheaper and now with the advent of the barrel bikes coming in I think we're going to see that as well. Um, let's move on to something else. Um, so I'm looking at, this is really, sorry, I'm going to be really benign and, and go through this quite um, religiously. So we're going to go to postcode and age, and it's obviously, I mean, 27% of the sample, which is a total base sample of 3,119. Sorry if I'm boring anyone. Um, I don't intend to. Um, what I do, actually. Um, but PO4 is obviously clearly the, the big area, which is obviously in South Sea. Um, just, just for I mean, clarity, it doesn't actually say it in the report, but I, I'm, I'm assuming that's where more of the racks are to make more sense of why it's at 27% when, for example, PO6 and PO2, which has minimal racks, which is, I would say, Cosham and Hillsy area, would be um, the same number, but yet, yeah, you know, not, not as big. Yeah, there, there is... Um 
Yeah, so I can say to that is that uh, the, um, there is a strong correlation. I, I basically put the two maps together on my screen and had a, a look, and there is a very strong correlation. What we're going to do is, again, just work on some uh, yeah, a finer grains version that we'll be happy to circulate to you and, uh, and others here. Um, but it is, it's intuitive, yeah. yeah. That, that would be great. I just think that that sort of information would be quite interesting to see because it would be obviously who the users are, what journeys they're taking, and, how, and what methods they're taking to get there. Um, all right, two seconds. I've got... No, that doesn't mean that's not relevant. Really Gareth, could you? Is it possible when you do your surveys, you, you ask with how with they, the hirer um, have previously used a, otherwise have used a car or a taxi? Could you put in public transport there? Could you yeah. add it to the survey? Yeah, that, that, that's one of the that, that's where that data comes from, councillor. It's um, it's basically asking how you would have made yeah, that, that journey, yeah, and yes, it's got. Yeah. Essentially, every but obviously option. that wouldn't give you the route, but it doesn't give you no, the route. No, no. no. Uh, just inter interesting, Gareth. I'm going I'm to look at the. Do you, do you want to have a look on that? And, and no, go. I've got it here. Okay. I've got all the pages folded over. That I'm, I'm going to. I'm, I'm, I'm well in there. Don't worry. Good. Um, I'll, I'll stop in about six pages time, and no, then probably about eight pages actually. Uh, so if, if we're going to look at page 59, I think that's talking about the barriers to users compared with a comparison to previous waves. It's, it's quite actually quite a really good chart, Gareth, if I'm honest. It, it gives us an idea of um, what people are doing, which I, I quite like. And it's obviously wave three and two and four. The interesting one that I've picked out is safety concerns. That that's, that's a significant jump in terms of the numbers from wave two and wave three. So obviously users are saying that there are probably more safety concerns rather than what there was previously. I mean, is there anything that's been highlighted in, in, in the findings that you could probably pick to that, saying why that has jumped? Um, no, so we did look at that, and it, 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 yeah, it's popped out at us, um, of course, as well as something to keep an eye on. Um, the, you know, it's, we're very fortunate that we do get um, a strong response to these surveys. Um, I think with safety in particular, we you know we don't want to kind of just put it down to variance, but it could you know, vary from one to the next. Um, and we, um, yeah, I think based on that feedback, also the feedback from um, f from the, the members that attended the feedback sessions um, and and a lot of the um, other safety related questions in there, it, it was. It, you know, it's really paramount. The reason the first recommendation in this report isn't about extending the trial; it's actually about you know continuing to to offer the um, to, to offer those uh, training sessions and, and promote helmet use. Is is that we yeah we, we need to just continue to hammer home that message. I, I've got a meeting uh, with Roy within the next couple of weeks to look at the plans for 2023, um, offering those training sessions not just at, at Lakeside and then Guildhall Square as we have done so far, but in in other locations. Um, in the city, so, so maintaining that, even though people are becoming more accustomed um, to using these scooters, you know, just to, to not, yeah, not let up on that, and looking at how we can um, sort of more proactively tie in with um, planned cycle routes as well. This report again strongly um, conveys the fact that where e-scooter uh, users feel most safe is in segregated bike lanes. So, so you know, we're working closely with the other teams in the council to see where, um, yeah, where those connections make make sense. Um, um, so, again, I think that the sort of finer grain of information can be quite hard to get from these surveys. You, you almost want to go back and ask the people that, uh, you, you know, uh, reported that, what, what their reasons were. But um, there is a lot that we can, can take from that and, and indeed from, from um, sort of members' um, feedback as well. So we'll continue to work on that. Okay, no, that's, that's fine. I think it's a good answer. Um, page 62 is talking about other forms of transport. So when we think back, the question is thinking back to your last rental e-scooter trip, what mode of transport would you have used for your journey? Um, I think it's conscious as well that the base numbers for Wave 4 and Wave 2 are considerably higher than Wave 3, and I, I personally, looking at the base number for Wave 3, I would not use that as a, as a something to, to measure against. I'd rather you go between 4 and 2, because I think you've got a significant number there. And it's quite interesting that the private car it, is the same, effectively. It hasn't really moved, uh, which tells me that we've still got the same, not the same amount of people, but the same amount of mindset. So we're not actually moving the needle as much as potentially we would have liked to. Um, and I just, I just think it's interesting to see how we would do that if we are going to proceed with the trial. How are we going to get more people using? Because that seems to be a barrier at the moment. It's not really moving between two and four. Wave two and four, I, sorry. I mean, what we say to, uh, to that is the, the percentage that's coming across in the... Um, Portsmouth Council uh, survey 
it, it is very much at the higher end of any expectations that we had. Um, you know, going into the trial, looking at sort of international benchmarking um, as well as national um, the VOI surveys, which uh, get slightly fewer respondents, also showing um, over 45%. Um, you know, and, and for Portsmouth, for the surveys have shown between 55 and 60% coming from car or taxi. Overwhelmingly, that's going to be um, going to be car. And um, I think the you know, honestly, when we first saw that for, for Wave 2, we were just desperately hoping that as the scheme uh, grew um, and, and became, you know, had far more users, um, that, that percentage would stay the same. Because, of course, if it stays at 55% and you're talking, you know, many hundreds of thousands more trips, then uh, that's why we end up with so many trips off the road. So not to say that there isn't more that can be done. You know, it would be wonderful if we got that up to 70 or 80 percent, but I would just manage expectations by saying that any time I'm presenting this to counterparts in other cities, um, then there's, you know, they're looking at what are we doing right to, to copy. So. That's it, but we should always strive for better, as I say. Um, you know, but well done anyway. Um, page 68, Gareth, and we're going to talk about this is going to go into the nature of the attitudes towards e-scooters. I think this is really the crux of the argument that comes across. Um, and I think it's, it's some really good data, by the way, um, when it talks about, if anyone's gone to sleep, I apologise. Um, the rental e-scooter should be banned from Portsmouth. I think that's the one that's got users and non-users across wave two, three, and four. Um, obviously, non-users have contributed far more to the argument than the users, which I think is, is something that we need to um, put out there. I think it's good for the public to know. The, the position really hasn't changed for non-users. They are quite consistently at 66, 65% they want it to be banned. Whereas it has slightly dropped on the user side, um, which is that because people are going away from e-scooters or is it just the sheer fact that, you know, we have seen a a neither argument that's risen. So I think there is there is a people that are going in the middle at the moment, and I just don't know what the answer to that is. I mean, have you what sort of um, feedback have you had? Yeah, um, again, it, uh, something that we noticed that that had that had gone down a little bit. Um, and it's something to keep an eye on. You know, I wouldn't be at all surprised if when we do the Wave 5 survey, it comes back, you, you are going to get that, that kind of variance. But, but again, we don't want to sort of rest on our laurels with that. And if there's people that have used the scheme that wouldn't you know, recommend it to others, then both for, for, for us and, and for uh, Voy, it's understanding you know, why that is. We know that the main reason still that um, those who, um, uh, you know, the main barrier that um, users of the scheme see to using the scheme is, is, is the availability of parking. And of, of course, we're continuing to work on that um, and to, to kind of expand the reach so that um, people do have both their origin and destination locations within a, a relatively short walk. Um, so hopefully, as you know, again, as that continues to expand, we'll, we'll see that, that number um, at, at least kind of stabilize and ideally go up. Uh, the last thing you said was very interesting as well, which is, uh, uh, you know, it's there doesn't seem to be, it's a kind of Marmite thing, there doesn't seem to be much in between. It's, it's either people um, saying that these are great and they would recommend them or that they you know, very much wouldn't. Um, I think that it's inherent in these surveys, so you know you're going to hear from people that have have that strong view on one side or the other, and uh, you know users, non-users, and so forth. Um, and I think it would be interesting if we were able to go out and kind of yeah speak to to sort of people in the streets a bit more um, and find out their views, which of course you do as councillors. And I, I know that generally you've reported to, as we've seen as well that the feedback has become uh, sort of warmer to the trial over over the, the course of the trial and. and and actually the main issue that people are still raising is with the private um, scooters which of course haven't got all of these um, you know controls and limitations and, and scrutiny in place so um, it yeah it's hard to capture that in the data but I, I think that that's something that we're all feeling quite you know confident about at the moment okay on, on page I think page 71 is talking about the overall attitude and I think that is that is key to the feedback that you've received because to say it was positive would be wrong just from from the overall data that you have it's, it's mostly a negative attitude towards it. It's well into it's 60, 65, nearly 70 percent in certain waves, which isn't isn't ideal, is it? I mean, I understand it's not ideal, uh, but obviously we've got to make a decision about whether we continue today, and that's thankfully not my decision. It's Councillor Snag's decision. Um, what I will say is about the sample data, because it's clear that we've already said that users are having less of a, a say than non-users as effect, but we know that there are several hundreds that people have had trips on. How are we going to engage 
in a more thorough way to get, because uh, I, I would like to see that th this sort of thing carry on, by the way, um, to see we can engage people that are using more to have their say, because at the moment it's a, it's a very one-sided argument, and the data stacks as a one-sided argument. It's, it would be very easy to use a data set and say, don't, you know, we need to change something or something's not working. Um, but obviously I want to see how you would um, change the way you engage, because there's clearly people out there that are engaging, but not to the number of the non-users. Yeah, um, it, again, it's an ongoing challenge with, uh, you know, engagement and consultation uh, exercises. Um, you, we, the um, the, the uh, consultancy that has been helping us with the monitoring and evaluation of this scheme, which I mentioned before, um, in the context of the safety um, safety data, is TRL, um, and that's a long-term partnership that Solent Transport has with them to, to help monitor not just the e-scooter trial but um, other um, aspects of um, the Future Transport Zone program. Um, so I'll take that away and, and speak to them um, about ways that we may be able to, uh, you know, I think as you say, get a more uh, representative um, uh, sample. Um, it, it's it's mentioned in this report as well it was um, something that we did for wave three when we were using uh, the, the, you know, some uh, other uh, independent consultants uh, helping is is if you reweight the, um, the, the survey data according to the uh, age demographic profile of Portsmouth then straight away that has an impact so I think it was about five percent or so um, sort of more positive um, and, and so it, yeah it's 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 quite nuanced, and I think we we can look at what we could do to to help you to, to better understand you know what those sort of middle views are, if you like. I've got to be honest; it's really it is really thorough and it's really well presented, and it's a really good report. So I just want to say thank you for bringing it. It's it's good to see that we're we're doing these exercises. We're actually getting significant data back to us. Um, also, we're just going to Councillor Peterhouse. Could I ask if you've got any more questions that are that detailed? Could you sort of um, email them to? Um, no, I'd rather do it in public. Gareth. It's fine. Only because the other people... No, it's fine. We've got time. Okay. Um, I was just, I was just um, finishing up anyway, so don't worry. Didn't understand a word of that, sorry. I was just finishing up, so don't worry. Right, okay. No, um, as I was saying, Gareth, no, it's very good. The overall, the overall report in, in itself, um, it shows that we need to do something and something has to happen. Um, but personally, I, 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 the jury's out still for me on... on these. I, I just want to see more information coming forward, um, and I'll let Gray, um, Councillor Graham Mahini have his say now because I'm sure you're all bored. Thank you, Councillor Peter Harris. Councillor Heaney. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. I mean, I don't have any problem with detailed questions being asked. I think it's appropriate to do so, so it doesn't bother me. No, I'm fine. Um, in relation to the survey, I mean, as far as the survey goes, I'm not sure if everyone who's watching this is aware, but as far as I understand it, the survey is purely a, a respondent-driven survey, i.e. people who respond are the ones we have actually got doing the survey. This is not a, um, a, a survey that is, is determined by a, a, a process of, of some sort of scientific sort of attempt to get a representative sample. It's just the people who responded. And it does seem to me, you know, looking at that, that it's quite often the case that if people are against something, they're more likely to respond to something than if they're for something, or if they're reasonably, you know, don't really bother one way or the other. So I suppose that might account for the fact that we have a fairly high level of response. And I don't know if that assumption is something that the uh, people doing the survey would, ag would agree with. <laughs> I've got another couple of questions as well. Thank you. Um, I, I, I would just add, I think, that... I think when there's legislation controlling not just the the, um, the voice scooters, but but the private scooters as privately owned scooters as well, you'll have a change in. Um, there'll be some people who'll be dead against the scooters, whatever, but they're going to be here, you know, forever. Well, well, for, until the next phase of uh, technology comes along. Um, but I'm I'm happy to to um, agree to extend the the um, the trial purely and simply because I think. Um, um, with more evidence from all over the country, because it's not just here, it's all over the country, um, I hope the DFT will come up with some legislation. Um, for example, you know, having insurance, the, the quality of the bike, of the scooters being um, um, made, um, there, there needs to be some legislation. You know, you can't just build a car that is rubbish and will fall to, to, to pieces. Um, so you need to have something that's... And, 
that's uh, quite solid. And that's one of the things about the voice scooters. They are sturdy. Um, but we've also get, got to get people behaving properly um, on them. And I've, I've, um, I've said to you, Gareth, I've noticed more um, people riding on pavements. And I, 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 I shout at them. Um, or I report them. And, uh, well, they, they have to, they're supposed to be behaving um, in, a, in a sensible, safe way. But the thing is that we don't ban um, cars, for example, you know. I mean, on, on one day last week, I, I had, the, there was a car that was overturned in Tangier Road because it was going too fast on Tangier Road, hit another car, went onto its head, um, onto its roof. Um, uh, the car in front of me earlier in the day um, was speeding, went through um, a red light, and, and th then there was a bit later on a car behind me which was tailgating me, which I stopped and uh, um, had a, a bit of a discussion with the driver. Um, so, you know, we, we can't be just down on, on um, e-scooters, and but we need to have that legislation in place that covers it. And then I think we get a different response, because if you take them, um, some of those private ones off the road. One uh, was my dog walking friend, someone that you know, Councillor Heaney, um, was in Brist I think it was Bristol a couple of weeks ago um, uh, at a lecture. He's a lecturer at the university. And um, he didn't see one single privately owned e-scooter in Bristol. He saw plenty of um, trial ones, and I think the reason is that in Bristol the police have been enforcing, which they haven't been doing here. So and that was just one, one place, obviously. But So I'm happy to go along with both I, the recommendations. I do well. have other questions. I did say I had other questions. Oh, sorry. Yes, I did, yes. I, no, I said I have other questions. Oh, I, I didn't, I didn't hear that. You speak so well. quietly that I can't, can't <laughs> hear. Okay, I'm well, sorry. I've been talking most of the day to my students, so maybe my voice is a bit wrong. Um, in reference to paragraph 5.15, I noticed we talk about the accidents there and the uh, statistics, and I just wonder, I don't expect an answer now because I was thinking about it actually when I was reading it the other day, that is it possible to do some comparison with the accidents on scooters and accidents on bicycles? Because clearly we have an issue around bike safety and bike accidents. And I just wondered if we would be able to do some sort of comparison to see whether boys scooters are any you know, more dangerous for people who are riding them, or less dangerous than cyclists, or what? It would just be an interesting comparison, I think, to do with this mode of transport. Well, if we can Michelle the would have the statistics on I'm, I'm cycle. not expecting a direct answer. No, 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 but um, what I'm saying back. is Michelle would but have that information, that I think, possible, wouldn't you, Michelle? Know. Not now, but... No, no, is that possible? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, th thank you. Yeah, I, I actually um, I responded to um, a, a ward councillor's inquiry about that quite recently. So um, it was. I think it's it, it's we would all like to know that comparison um, for sure. Um, it's what we've got to be really careful with is is that we're comparing with apples with apples and and the the accident rates that um, I'm sure you know Michelle has her, her fingertips for um, cycling and, and other modes at the moment are very, very difficult to compare with the e-scooter accident rates. The reason being, um, and this is what, you know, not just in the Solent and not just our consultants, what, what we're all finding is that the most reliable data sets that we have are from the operators. Um, it's self-reported, but it's the most reliable because the police national database doesn't have an e-scooter category. And even if in the free text box it does say e-scooter, it then doesn't say whether it's a private or public e-scooter. We know from some work that our consultants have been doing for us recently, different police forces are all filling it in in different ways. So, um, so although we are looking at Hampshire constabulary data and doing some cross-checking um, to just really help to understand better what you know what the accidents are, where they're occurring, etc. Um, in terms of an accident rate, the best that we have at the moment is 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 the one that's coming from the e-scooter operators themselves, which makes it very hard to compare. That said, we do of course have a bike share scheme um, that's just begun in, in the city and indeed uh, in Southampton. So we're already starting to look at, although it's a different operator, what kind of comparisons could be done there to help us to get a better gauge on, on that, that difference. And um, Councillor Stack sort of touched on it as well about the um, issue of um, the private scooters and enforcement. And whilst it's not necessarily the main focus of the report, I do think it's relevant because people I don't think necessarily make a judgment between e-scooters and the 
the, the, the rental is good as in the private ones when they're making their views known about about their their use. I mean, it would be useful. I know I know Hampshire police are under a lot of pressure. They've got a lot of other things to do, but it would be helpful to know, or if they would be prepared to let us know, um, what they are doing about the enforcement on this, because um, it, you know it's very clearly a, a not legal to use them. I, I, I think it's very difficult. Well, it's possible people don't know it, but I mean, it's very difficult not to know it because of the amount of information that's put out about this. Um, but it's still a, it, is, it is still an issue, and also it's a it's an issue of safety for those individuals who use them because they're often used in a way which is clearly not as safe as maybe someone using a rental lease good who has you know decided to use that for particular reasons. I have to say, I think the retailers also have some responsibility here. I actually went and had a look back in September in some of the retailers to see what. Um, what they what they what they sell, and I was quite amazed at some of the you know the the, the, the skies and scale of some of these things, and the little notices they tag on them saying oh, you mustn't use this on the road, and I, I would be quite interested to know. Well, I didn't actually get a chance to talk to anyone because there was no one around. But you know, when somebody is buying one of these, are they really sitting down and telling them actually you're not allowed to use this except in your garden uh, or on your estate wherever you live? Um, I, I don't mean housing estate. <laughs> And um, they may well, or they may well not, but very clearly um, they are selling these things and they are disclaiming responsibility for what happens to them afterwards. Now, they might say, well, yes, it's up to the individual to decide what to do with them, and that may well be in part true, but they do have some responsibility here. It may also be that people are acquiring these scooters, you know, not via normal retailers, but via the internet or whatever, which again is, a, is, is, is an issue. But I think it does tie into this idea of enforcement, and I do think that I would like to see the police being a bit more upfront and a bit more public about their enforcement of this so people know something has been done and sends the message that these things are not legal to use because there is going to be a crunch coming when and if if the government gets its act together and does actually legislate about this um, they will have to make some decisions because I don't think we can s sit with the current situation where we have private scooters being sold and other scooters being legal and not doing something about the private ones. I think there will have to come a crunch where they have to say that you are not allowed to sell these things unless they are licensable or you know meet the required standards. Um, and that crunch is going to come at some point. So I do think you know it would be helpful if we maybe started to do something about this now um, with the police enforcement, but also um, yeah, making making people aware that. Uh, um, you know, they shouldn't be riding these, and they will probably be unable to uh, once they become legacy scooters, which people will have in their garage or wherever, and will not be able to use them. Can I'll I, uh, Gareth, do you meet with the police? I know um, uh, Haley used to. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we, we do. It's, um, yeah, so uh, again, you know, certainly something that we would echo. I think that the, um, so we were all looking forward to, to some some clarity around the um, private scooter um, sort of laws and rules post uh, May 2024. And um, one thing I would say that I, I do know from a, a recent meeting that the DFT is you know is working hard on that. They're, they're taking a lot of feedback from stakeholders, including ourselves, at the moment to help shape um, the, the the plans uh, for that. Um, the um, in terms of the uh, sort of Hampshire constabulary, yes, we we um, have regular meetings with them. We've got one actually in the next couple of weeks. Um, I, I've already made a note that we'll uh, we'll raise that um, with them just while you were uh, speaking, Councillor Heaney. Um, I think it would be last time we did. We knew that London was the only the London Metropolitan Police was the only force in a scooter area that was um, sort of actively seizing um, private scooters. I think just because the, the scale of the issue was was greater there. Um, and essentially, uh, other other forces, including ours, were keep, keeping a sort of watching brief and, and giving out some warnings. Um, but that was that's probably about nine months ago now that that was their official position. Um, so we'll we'll pick that up in a couple of weeks now that we know these you know trials are continuing for you know the best part of two more years um, to to see if that's still the position or whether there'll be a sort of strict enforcement action that could be taken. So I'm happy to report back on that as well. Thank you. Is it? Is it worth our while writing to the Police and Crime Commissioner and asking for her support? After all, she used to be um, councillor here, <laughs> calling some favours. But I think it might, might be just highlighting it so that uh, something might come out of it. Have you got any more questions, Councillor Heaney? Okay, thank you. Right. Well, I'm, I'm, as I said before, I'm happy to, to go with the two 
main re recommendation is which is approving the renewal of the vehicle special order um, and approving the extension of the voice contract initially for 12 months and noting everything else. Thank you. Right. You are now on to item number five, um, which is um, proposed one way streets between Winter Road and East New Road. Is it Michelle, are you presenting this? I thought you might be. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stagg. Um, yes, I'm bringing the report subject TRO 5822, proposed one-way streets between Winter Road and East New Road. The purpose of the report is to consider the recommendation in line with the consultation results to implement the proposed one-way streets on Maxwell Road, Langard Road, Tredegar Road and Reginald Road. The recommendation of the report is that the Cabinet member approves the implementation of TRO 58 2022 to implement a series of one-way streets including contraflow cycling following resident engagement and formal consultation. To go through the background of, of the report, uh, the the one-way proposals were initially raised with uh, members through the interactions with residents, either on street or in surgeries. There was a statutory consultation of TRO 58 2022. Um, the TRO process invites objections to the advertised proposal. There were objections received and a copy of these is included in the report in Appendix B. As a result, and to further test the acceptability of the proposals, the Cabinet Member for Traffic and Transportation requested that further engagement was carried out. This was done uh, between the 13th and the 20th of July, when the Portsmouth City Council Transport Engagement Team engaged with residents uh, door knocking on street um, to give them preferred three options of a preferred traffic regulation order design, option one, option two, or no change. In total, 168 households res responded to the residents' survey, uh, representing a response rate from the total number of households of 36%. Out of those responses, 75% were in favour. 55% of those respondents were in favour of a one-way streets design proposed in option one. That's the basis of the report, but I'm happy to take further questions after that. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Councillor Heaney. Yeah, I have one question. I mean, obviously the residents have um, been involved in this and it's very much a forward particular issue, but I just wondered if the cycle forum had been made aware of this proposal and had been asked for any, or have got any views on it. The cycle forum have always given the view that if we are going to implement one-way streets, that they would like to see contraflow cycling. Um, so they, the resident door knocking was quite ward specific within the roads, and we obviously hold regular meetings with the cycle forum to keep them updated of schemes. If this scheme is given approval at the meeting, then we will involve them in the final design. Anything right, else? so they, they, haven't, they haven't had any view of this prior to this decision meeting taking place. That was the understanding I got from the answer. They haven't actually seen this. and. There hasn't been a final design to present, so oh, the okay, consultation right. has been um, resident specific within those roads, but they obviously will be involved if approval is given. Nothing else? Right. Councillor Peter Harris. Thank you. I'm just looking at this. Um, this is literally on the border of Central South Sea Ward that the one way street goes up to because it, it splits at Winter Road, which is obviously on the borderlands effectively. Were the Central South Sea Ward councillors discussed with, because this is going to cause a knock-on effect to them and people that live in Central South Sea? Uh, this was initiated by the Milton Ward councillors. Yes, I know that because it's in Milton Ward, but it's on the ward boundary and I think commonly it would be quite a, a good idea to involve the Central South Sea Ward councillors because there will be a knock-on effect for the traffic going one way onto Winter Road. Absolutely, we can. If this report is given approval, then we will certainly involve the Central South Sea Ward Council. The problem I have with it is that we've already done the work, and effectively they've been excluded until effectively at a decision-making stage. Whereas it might have been a good idea to get their feedback earlier. Um, I mean, I've, I've had instances that in my own ward, for example, that have boarded onto Nelson Ward or boarded onto Cotton Ward, and we've been engaged with um, both at the same time. And I'll give you a good example: would be Mayfield School about the issues around there. That are, um, that have, been causing, that have been caused issues recently and we've had um, joint briefings because one will knock on the other and this is very similar 
and yet the Central South Sea Ward councillors are probably being shortchanged effectively because this is, going to, this is going to affect them and yet they've not been consulted on. Can you specify the, the impact it's going to have? Well, you're, you're changing the road layout. So effectively, you're pushing all the, strip, all the road going one way, and it's not going into Milton Ward. It's going out of Milton Ward into Central South Sea. So it's pushing it onto Winter Road, which is going to have a knock-on effect to the people that live in that side of the ward. And no one's asked them the question. The opposite will be true as well when the, the other side goes out onto East, East New Road. Is that point? Then I mean, this is this is what I'm talking about. So we're getting one set of. I mean, I think Councillor Heaney knows exactly where I'm going with that. That you, I mean, they should have been consulted because they might have actually said that this is causing an issue. And it's, for example, I'll give you a great example. If we were doing a parking zone and it was causing a knock-on effect, you'd survey the people around it, wouldn't you? You wouldn't just do it in that slight area. And I'll give you an example of the HC parking zone where the people were surveyed around the area. Yet the Central South Sea Ward Council, I don't even know why I'm speaking of Central South Sea, it's probably for fairness more than anything, but they haven't been consulted, and that's the biggest issue I have with this. You know, I don't have an issue that people want it, because I think it's quite a sensible idea, but if we're doing things, we have to ask the questions in the correct way and involving everyone on the journey, because what I don't want, this could be perfectly fine, Michelle, this is really hypothetical, it could be perfectly all fine. I mean, what I don't want is us to implement something, and then all of a sudden, we're getting lots of people that live on the other side of Winter Road, in Shredgar Road, for example, which is, I'm going to use, or Aston Road or Hunter Road, that are saying, or, you know, saying that all of a sudden, I've got lots of traffic that are pulling out, and they're, they're using us as a cut through, because obviously they've already had a one-way street put in through. Um, so, I just, I just think they should have been consulted. That, that's, that's really my, my main point. It's, it's, right on the, it's right on the border of the two wards, where it's all, all the traffic's getting pushed to in one way, and they haven't actually been asked the question. I personally can't see, but it would be 50-50, wouldn't it? I can't, I may be entirely wrong, but it's the same amount of traffic, but it's just... Yeah, but you're pushing the traffic all one way. This is, this is the point I'm making. It, it's on the border. The actual board, I mean, I've got the map up. It's literally, the traffic is going from there to there, and it's pushing it all down here. So it's going to naturally go into this cycle. It's right on the border. Then you should have, really, in hindsight, you should be consulting both sets of water. Well, it's a Milton scheme. It's going to impact on Central South Sea. That would be the sensible thing to do. But we're, we're so far down the line that nobody's actually done that. Do we normally do that? not the case of where we normally should do it, it's no, what we no, should do. I'm just do. asking, if we deviated from, from what we normally do. We haven't previously done that, but I can see Councillor Peter Harris's point, and if they would like it built into future consultation processes, then we absolutely would, would do that. Um, with the case of these roads, they're residential roads. We've done traffic surveys. There's an average of 26 vehicles per hour traveling down each of these roads. So, as you say, there's 50% of the, now what we will have is 50% of the traffic going one way and 50% of the traffic going the other way. If there was a higher number of vehicles travelling along those roads as they stand at the moment, then we would obviously look further into mitigating measures that we would need. But they obviously are at the moment uh, residential roads that are used by residents. So. At 26 vehicles an hour coming out onto those onto the uh, Eastney Road or Winter Road is unlikely to change. We will obviously monitor the scheme, um, and then if the volume of traffic has increased, because that is a risk with one-way streets that it can then be attractive to motorists, then obviously we will put in place mitigating, uh, mitigating measures to ensure the safety of, of residents and, and pedestrians. But at the moment, as it stands, it's around 26 vehicles per hour in each direction. Thank you. That's a fair point. I just have a couple of other bits. Um, I'm just going to go to the Director of Finance comments because I think that's quite interesting. It says, this scheme is going to cost £40,000 from the one-way streets and low traffic neighbourhoods allocation, which interestingly you said we don't have low traffic neighbourhoods last Tuesday. So maybe we should change the name of the pot of money. No, no. no. What, uh, Curtin, are you talking about the article in the news? Yeah. Well, I've taken it to task because I made it clear it was not a low traffic neighbourhood at all. And no, I'm I, not I the call, only one who's taken him to task. Yeah, Councillor Bosch called it a low traffic neighbourhood, not you. Um, so, no, and it says the, the funding's 40,000. Just out of interest, is the pot of money, is the ov overall pot of that £120,000? 
That's correct. It's identified in the capital budget 2020-2021, and the overall pot is 120,000, with 40,000 being allocated towards this scheme and the remainder being allocated towards the active Pompey neighbourhoods. The reason that it's called low traffic neighbourhoods is because it was published and decided before um, our scheme, the active Pompey neighbourhood, came into being. So we all know that active Pompey neighbourhoods is a nice name for low traffic neighbourhood. It's just because LTNs haven't got a really good positive reputation over there in the press. So, I mean, let's not sugarcoat it. We all know the truth. If you, um, if you Google low traffic neighbourhood, it's quite, um, quite damning, especially in London. Um, you know, for, for example, I mean, the officers, so some officers there are smiling, so they clearly know that I'm right. Um, on this point, so 80,000 is being allocated for the Central South Sea scheme. Is that correct? That is correct. The Active Pompey neighbourhood is in Central South Sea. Active Pompey neighbourhood, brilliant. On message and on brand, Michelle, well done. Always. Uh, but that's, that's it, thank you. That's all I've got to add. Very good. Thank you, Councillor Peter Harris. Um, yes, I'm happy to go along with, I can't remember what the, uh, yes, um, I approved the implementation of TRO 58, whatever. Thank you. Well, I think it's something we need to sort of look at in future. But I don't, I'm not aware in my time as portfolio holder that we have consulted with surrounding um, areas when we've done something like this, but I could be entirely wrong. Um, right. What are we on now? Item number, oh yes. Um, Item number six, six um, disabled persons parking places. Um, and that's, is that you, Kevin? Yes, it is. Thank that's you. Um, yeah, the, the report concerns the proposed disabled uh, parking space outside 53 Old Farm Way. Um, the resident uh, meets the criteria for having a bay. Uh, we advertised the proposal. Uh, and received 10 objections, four from residents of Old Farm Way, three from residents of Denville Close, uh, two from family members and, and one uh, representation. It wasn't clear where the, the resident lived. Um, the full text of the objections uh, is detailed in Appendix B of the report. Um, Old Farm Way um, is a road where vehicles park uh, on one side on the road and on the other side they tend to park uh, partially on the root carriageway and partially on the footway. Um, there have been disabled bays on the carriageway uh, previously in Old Farm Way um, outside number 45 and the traffic flowed okay. Um, and um, again with, with the bay on the carriageway and other vehicles parking up on the footway um, we have a number of other examples uh, of roads that are narrow where that happens uh, and traffic still flows. Um, but if there was an issue, um, because we've got a proposal for a bay on the carriageway on one side, uh, if vehicles parking on the opposite side of the road caused, a, caused an issue, we could introduce a yellow, double yellow line to stop it. But that would make it more restrictive on the the residents parking in the area. So we, we're recommending implementing, implementing the bay uh, as proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Um, Scott. I don't envy you, councillor, on this one. It seems to be a, seems to be a really um, difficult decision to make. So I, I, I think you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So back over to you. Have you got any questions? No, okay, thank you. Councillor Heaney. Yeah, I do have a couple of questions, actually. <clears throat> um, I was presented with a written deputation from a resident when I came into the meeting. And at the end of the deputation, the person says that I would like to personally attend and have sent a deputation request to Democratic Service, but I'm yet to receive a reply. Um, could someone enlighten me on to what happened to that? Because they are not here. We do have a written one. Is it that they've changed their mind and we've got the written one? Or have they not had a response to their request to have a deputation? Um, what's the situation? Jane? Chair, um, yes, we have had further correspondence with the resident. And they said they're not attending. So um, they would like you to, con well, you all to consider their, their written deputation that you have. It was yeah. sent to you this morning. 
Um, yes, I'm sorry. I should have um, said there's a deputation. I forgot it was Bernie. Yeah, I mean, some of us who are, were, aren't able to access our council emails when we're working, so we don't see this until we come here, which is why I come straight right. from work. So yeah. that's why I haven't, I haven't seen it. And so I wanted to ask the question just to clarify, because I have read the deputation um, very quickly and just saw that point at the end and wanted to clarify the resident had been given an opportunity to do that or had resolved the issue. That was what I was clear about. Another question about the, <clears throat> on the uh, Appendix B, uh, we've got the public views, we've got two photographs which were sent in. Were those photographs sent in by the resident making the comment? Um, is that the case? Yes, then, they were. The, so they are, right, that's the ones they sent in, okay, right. Um, that's useful to know. Um, I just wondered if Kevin's got any comments on the, what the deputation has actually said about their concerns and how he might... Um, answer them. I'd be interested for his view on it. Yes, certainly. Um, I think in the deputation, the um, resident gives different measurements to the road, but even if you take those measurements, vehicles can still pass if there's a bay in the road, uh, and even if there are vehicles on the other side parked up on, uh, partially on the carriageway and partially on, on the footway. So it doesn't um, change our um, recommendation in, in that respect. Um, I think the um, resident making the deputation is currently parking one car on their hard standing and one car on the carriageway outside their drop curb. Um, I mean what happens in other parts of the road and as what happens in that part of the road is uh, currently the vehicles a parking on the north side slightly up on on the pavement and fully on the carriageway on the south side where the person making the deputation lives if we put a bay on the north side it might be that the person on the south side parks slightly up on the on, on the pavement and it just swaps over the order in which that that occurs with regard to the two photographs that accompany the deputation they do show disabled bay that is partly marked are these um, old ones or existing but ones that already are in op in use or not? I believe the photograph, um, as I referred to in, in my in the in the report, um, there was a disabled bay outside number forty five old farmway, uh, which was fully on the carriageway. I think the photographs show that marked on the road, but because it's not in use anymore. Vehicles are parked fully on the carriageway on the opposite side of the road. Um, I believe when that bay was in operation, vehicles wouldn't have parked directly opposite um, because that would block the road. What they might have done is parked opposite slightly on the pavement. As I say, as you go down Old Farm Way, um, the vehicles do park on the carriageway on one side and on the footway on another, and it swaps over halfway through. Um, that's useful to know. Thank you for that. I mean, th this essentially uh, is, is a, a, again, a ward specific issue. I'm not hugely familiar with the road. I mean, I know of it, but I don't, I don't, I don't you know, walk down it regularly. Have the ward councillors made any representations on this at all, either for or against, or do we know? They expressed a. No. No, okay. Well, um, I'm, I mean, like Councillor Pendez, I think I'm going to leave it to the current member to make the decision because I think, to, it, you know, it, it, we may have to modify it if. It, if, if if it goes ahead, um, but I, th I don't think I, I've got a particularly, you know, a particularly strong view about this one, so I'll leave it to you to decide. Kevin, can I, can I ask you, in 6.2 it says, um, the resident associated with the disabled bay is currently parking in the road, so there is little effect on the availability of parking space. Okay, so the, the, the person who is asking for this disabled bay um, is already parking on, on the road, yes? So, would the disabled parking be, bay be significantly wider than the space taken up by the car that currently parks on the road? The, the disabled parking bay would be 1.8 metres wide and it would be on the carriageway. What currently happens is vehicles on the side that the resident lives currently right. par partially on the footway right. uh, and the cars on the opposite side park on the carriageway but if we designate a bay on the carriageway then it will push the vehicles to park slightly on the footway on the opposite side and you can still get cars through so it's not taking away parking it's just reordering the way in which they move around 
the vehicles parked on the carriageway, if that makes sense. So if there are disabled parking places, as they are in this, this um, photograph, and the cars parked there, how do cars get in? There's enough room. Do they, do they act almost like a chicane? The park, yes. The yes, the, disabled the, bay? Well, um, if, the, if it swaps over halfway down the road, then they'll chicane round. Um, it's, the width of the road doesn't change, and currently there's cars parked on the carriageway on the south side and partially on the footway on the north side. So what we're saying is we're putting a bay on the north side, which will yeah. be fully on the carriageway, so it will push the cars, if they still wish to park there, um, they could still park on the pave, partially on the footway and partially on the carriageway on the southern side, and there'll still be the same width of carriageway uh, for vehicles to get through. Right. So on that basis, I, I don't have a major problem with it. I can see that it's not ideal, but on the grounds that it's, uh, it's going to cost well over £4,000, isn't it, if she has to put, or he or she has to put the, the um, uh, off-road parking in herself, himself? Um, we don't know exactly how much right, it would cost. Okay. I mean, they could apply to a, for a grant to the council but, um, from adult social care, but obviously if... It's likely, to, it's likely to cost thousands. Yeah, um, unless yeah. we did the survey, we wouldn't know exactly how much, but many, many thousands. So uh, it would be difficult for somebody to pay out that sort of money. Well, you know, it depends how wealthy they are, obviously, but uh, um, it's, it's not cheap. And I, I think if the applicant for the bay had wanted to do that out of their own pocket, they probably yeah, would have yeah. done, and they wouldn't have applied to the council for either a grant or, or a bay. Well, I'm, I'm minded to sort of um, go with it and, 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 and monitor, see if there are any problems. If there are any problems, then we'll have to rethink, won't we? Yeah. So um, I think the, the recommendation is to, to accept that it be installed, yes. So right. I'm, I, I wouldn't say I'm happy with it, but I can see, you know, it, it's a difficult one. And there's no easy answer, so uh, um, I would go along with that. Yes, okay, thank you. Thank you. And I think the last one, is it Langston Road? Oh, am I right? Langston Road traffic calming. And who's doing that? Is it you again, Michelle? <coughs> it you. is Councillor Stagg, yes, thank you. So this is the Langston Road Traffic Calming 2023. The purpose of the report is that following a recent feasibility study considering options for traffic calming at Langston Road, the report has been produced to outline the data analysis carried out and the conclusions and recommendations. The recommendation of the report is that the Cabinet member approves the installation of speed cushions or other, other appropriate traffic calming measures on Langston Road in Baffins Ward. The decision was reached by a feasibility study which took into account speed survey data, traffic count data and accident reports. We analysed 50 roads. The 50 roads were taken from those which had high levels of casualty and those which had been requested by councillors, residents and other stakeholders such as the emergency services. When these roads were analysed for speed in both directions, it came out that Langston Road was top of the list. A speed survey and traffic count was commissioned in March 2022. Langston Road had an 85th percentile speed, so that's the speed at which 15% or more of the drivers drive in excess of the advertised speed limit, and that was 12.2 miles in excess of the 20 mile an hour speed limit in the eastbound direction, and 11.7 miles per hour in excess of the limit in the westbound direction. There is an average daily traffic count of 1,264 on Langston Road in eastbound direction and 1,353 in the westbound direction. There were also five recorded accidents on Langston Road within the last five years. That further supports the requirement to implement traffic calming measures. There were three slight injuries and two serious injuries. Cyclists were the most impacted, making up 80% of the casualties on the road. The speed was recorded as 30 mile an hour, 10 mile an hour in excess of the advertised limit in 60% of those accidents reviewed. A number of different <coughs> options have been um, assessed. Uh, such as improved signage and lines, vehicle activated signage, speed humps, but due to the severity of the speeding issues noted and the presence of on-street parking, <laughs> it's been determined by officers that the installation of rubber speed cushions is the most appropriate solution to address the speeding issues. 
Funding is required from the parking reserve to enable Portsmouth City Council to progress to detailed design and address these issues and the construction of traffic calming measures identified at most, as most suitable in the location. That's the synopsis of the report, but I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Councillor Heaney. I mean, my, I only have one sort of main question, really. It's about the um, reference to the um, survey data. Um, is there any reason why the, um, the list of roads, if you like, and the priority isn't actually included within the report? I know it says that, but we never actually see the data. You know, we are told that's the case. Now, you know, I don't necessarily doubt it, but it will be interesting to see the data and the other roads that are actually part of this, uh, you know, demand for measures. But we never actually see that. Is there any reason why it isn't included in the report? Well, if, you, if you'd asked for it, I'm, I'm, well, I suppose you did know what was going in the report. Um, yeah, fair enough. Interestingly, and I didn't have it with me this morning and I, I may well have got rid of it because you know, they're out of paper but I'm pretty sure that I remember a table that was in because there was a reverberal report initially on this I think and but there was a table I think I saw which included Langston Road which partially gave that information when I looked I thought I'm sure there was a table in the last one unfortunately I haven't got the the original draft version because I, I think I may have got rid of it um, you know just to save uh, hold on to paper but you know I mean my question is you know why isn't it there? you sure it wasn't omitted from the report. At the briefing, we had the feasibility study as part of the background information, and that background information is listed in the appendix. But I can certainly just pull that out and send you. That, that's, not, that's not a problem. So it was, it was discussed at the briefing meeting. Councillor Heaney is correct there. Um, but it was never part of the text of the report, either at briefing or here. But I can send it to you tomorrow. That's not a problem. I mean, the reason I ask is because at the last meeting we had the Rainbow Corner issue raised, and I asked a question again about where this sits within the priority of other demands. Couldn't really get a sense of why this was the one that was getting the priority, at least not from the answer I got. I couldn't see why that was the reason, and I think it would be helpful both for members, because I don't have the same level of contact and access that you do as the cabinet member to all the data or anything else. And also for members of the public, because we have members of the public who ask us about it. I and mean, I've had some residents talking to me over the last couple of weeks about something. And they, uh, they sort of, they ask about something and then it goes into the system and then it disappears into the system and then we don't hear anything about it for a hell of a long time. And actually if we were able to demonstrate when we do agree things, you know, where we are with this, it would help the public perception of what the council is doing as well as elected members. Um, so I'm just thinking it would be helpful to provide a bit more information. I think I'm right in saying that this is one of the, it's been on the cards for a long time and it's, um, it's one that preceded the prioritisation that's taking place because because of the volume of, of requests coming in now, that's when um, we said we needed to start prioritising. Um, so, and it's because there's too, so many cars in, in the city now that it, it's becoming a major problem. So, no, no, nothing other than that. So. Okay. Any more? I, I, I hear you, you saying that, that you're actually starting to prioritise things, which sounds quite a good idea. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why, after three and a bit of years of being sitting on the um, here, um, we haven't done that before, really. <laughs> it, would, it does seem a bit, you know, yes, it's good it's being done, but it's being done, you know, very late. And again, I ask that there should be a bit more transparency about the information that is provided to the public, because these are public documents, about what we're doing on prioritisation. I think it would be good if we did that. Yeah, I'm sure that's, it's not anything hidden. Um, it's something that, that has evolved in, in response to um, increasing demand for various things. So, uh, well, I can say it's not very visible at the moment because I've been trying to find it out for a good long time and I'm just about getting to the point where I might be able to see this. So, um, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm quite happy for that to become far more uh, public. There's nothing to hide in there. So, Anything else, Councillor Heaney? Councillor Peter Harris, I'm sure you've got a question to ask. Or it's bit, I have actually. How did you know? I'm just, I'm just using the time because if I go home too early, I have to do bedtime. 
So I'm just trying to work it out, um, you know, so I can get home at a decent you know, time where I don't have to get involved. Um, you know, I think it's a good point for Councillor Beanie that if he can, we can have that information, it'd be great. I'm um, just going to go into, to basically, I think it's a really good idea, you know, the, the, the numbers stack up, it, it makes sense, you know, why would you not do it? Uh, just on the financial aspect of it, so it says on design, design and construction budget, which is 4.6, it says fundings required from the parking reserve which I believe too, but then it also says in 7.1 that it's a combination of LTP funds within the approved capital programme and the parking reserve. Could, do we know what the overall number of that budget is, for, is being aligned for this scheme? We don't currently, but we will share that with you when we have the detailed design. Obviously, part of the purpose of the parking reserve is to provide um, funding for road safety schemes, so it, it fits the criteria. Um, and there is, within the LTP budget each year, allocated a casualty and speed reduction budget because we have a statutory duty to investigate uh, speeding casualties and to provide either studies or solutions to that. So um, when a final design and final cost is known, then obviously we'll be able to provide that information. Um, with the current economic situation, it's difficult to put an exact price on it at the moment, but we will be as accurate as possible. What, what I'm saying, though, is I didn't ask for cost, I asked for budget. Cost and budget are two different things. The budget is assigned for what we're doing for the scheme. The cost will be how much it's actually going to cost. Just because it's a budget doesn't mean it's a limit. It's not a target. Um, so, so what I want to know is what the actual budget is, because if we were to say to pass this today and not identify how much it's going to cost or identify the funding, I don't think that would be a good idea. Just, just I want to just know what the budget is. You can just bear with me one second. I'll... I just thought it's prudent to ask. It's not in the report. Just to say that there are feasibility budgets that are set, and I think part of the improvements we're trying to put through is working past the budget, doing a lot more design work up front, so we can narrow that down. But this is this is one of those schemes that was predated some of the feasibility improvements that we put in place, and that was I think Lynn's point earlier. We we certainly have always prioritised. But we've do, what, what we're trying to do now is do more work to help the prioritisation, which is what we were trying to do, and reduce that to get a to go from budget to cost or closer to cost anyway. Absolutely, yeah. It's just it's more so there's no cost in it. Where every single other report we've looked at today has had a cost in, and this one hasn't. So I just I just want to get an idea of what the budget is because it doesn't have to. Actually, it might not cost that much. It might cost a lot less. If you, or it might cost more because we don't know how many um, speed cushions need to be put in. Oh, don't say that, Councillor. We don't want to spend more money. You want to, you want to no, save your budget. No, we could, actually, we could actually save. But, I mean, it's one of those things, what do you do? Do you do half a scheme? No, absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. I just want to know what we set for yeah, it so yeah, it makes fine. sense. Yeah. That's so where the park and the, the estimated budget that went into the feasibility work that we did was £100,000. When that progresses to detailed design, obviously we'll be able to give an updated figure on that. Langston Road is 700 metres long, and the recommended spacing for speed humps is between 70 and 150 metres. So that was what the pricing was based on. That's fine. I think Langston Road it is a really long road, and I don't envy those people that knock doors down there, i.e. Your, your mob. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a long road. Um, I understand that. But no, thank you for that. And that's, that's really all I've got to ask. I'm sure the residents will be absolutely ecstatic at uh, having something to, to cut on the speeding. I, I will say that the speeding is mainly, from my observations, um, um, in the evenings rather than in the daytime, because um, in the daytime there isn't the need to speed, um, whereas at night time, because of the parked cars, there's nowhere to, to pass, and so they go hell for leather from one end to the other, and because um, most of it is going straight through, because there are very few roads off it apart from Kim Bolton and uh, Litchfield, etc. So, um, so yes, I'm very happy to um, to approve that, and so will the residents be. So, thank you very much. Thank you for all the work that's gone into it, into the whole um, programme today, and um, thank you for your time. That's including you, Councillor Peter Hans. <laughs>